Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of The Xamarin Show. I'm your host, James Montemagno, and today we're going to be taking a look at Xamarin Forms, specifically some tips and tricks around performance and also some styling of your application. Now, with Xamarin, there's multiple approaches to application development. With kind of our traditional approach, you're really getting down and building native user interfaces for each platform. With Xamarin Forms, it introduces an abstraction layer of all the common controls. Now, a lot of developers jump right into Xamarin Forms because you write all of your user interface with XAML, with data binding, it's beautiful, a dependency service, messaging center, and I love it. I even built the Xamarin Evolve conference application completely with Xamarin Forms. But as you're building out these applications, we've been adding a lot of new features to Xamarin Forms. So I wanted to take some time today to just step through a few of my top tips and tricks to really get that extra perf that will really impress your users when they install your application. So first, let me just give you a quick, quick, quick overview of what Xamarin Forms is, and then we're going to jump into a few new features and just some general performance tips and tricks uh, to really add that extra perf boost. So first thing, Xamarin, like I said, we're building that shared C Sharp backend. So your first performance is always to build a great performant backend to your application. Now, with the traditional Xamarin approach, we're building out those separate UIs. But Xamarin Forms adds that abstraction layer in, adding all that shared code. Now, this is a you know, framework on top of the platform. So with the traditional approach, you're getting the exact same performance, bare metal performance, of a traditional application built in any other language. Just you're building everything in C Sharp with Xamarin. With Xamarin Forms, you're still building everything in C Sharp, and it's built on top of the platform. But of course, you have a framework. So there's going to be a little bit of extra overhead there. But with some of these tips and tricks, it can really fine tune your application. So I said there's a lot of controls, and these are what are abstracted today. And there's a lot of things built into Xamarin Forms, such as the 40 plus pages layout controls, to a data binding, and a navigation API, an animation API. And a lot of these things are already tuned for maximum performance. But let's actually just start out with the Xamarin Forms application, see what it looks like, and then spice it up a little bit. So what we're going to look at today is an application that I love and I've built out. It's called the My Weather application. It goes out and it finds you weather, uh, the current condition, uh, if it's rainy, if it's not, wherever you're at. And it can even use GPS location to do that. So here's the application running on uh, Windows 10 on the left, uh, iOS in the middle, and Android on the right. So I can go in and, and here's the first screen. We have some tabs, so you're getting proper tabs on each. I can say get the weather, 74 degrees here in Seattle. There we go. And of course, here I can refresh it over here. Clear skies, looking good. I can go over to the forecast, tap over there, and I can swipe through. And we have images correlating to everything. I can swipe through here, and the same thing over here on Android. So it looks pretty tuned up already. Um, but let's look at some of the things I can add in to spice up this application. And the first thing that I want to do is really tune up this, this Android application isn't quite looking how I really want it. I really want to take some, uh, take, uh, get access to some of the material design and some theming in here. I don't really like this bar up top and I don't really like this icon there. So let's first focus on the Android application and see how it was built. So here's our, our Xamarin uh, Forms application. I'll bump these up a little bit here. And what we can see on the top right is that we have our iOS, Android, and our Windows 10 application. All of our code is in this shared portable class library. So we have some services, we have a weather model, uh, we have some helpers for settings, uh, we have some view models. Now our forecast view uh, and our weather view are what is going to be built in the XAML. So here, for instance, we can see I have a stack layout. I have an entry that is doing some data uh, trigger binding here. I have the stack layout with a label and a switch in it. So you can kind of see how it correlates here one to one. There's a button, there's a label for temperature and condition with two-way data binding going back and forth. So if I come in and I enter uh, Cleveland, Ohio, where I'm originally from, we can go get the weather and this will reflect Cleveland's forecast. There we go. Now, our forecast uh, view, that nice little list view is right here. Uh, we have a stack layout. So there's our stack layout with the list view inside of it, data bound to our forecast items. 
And then I just have a nice view cell with an image uh, and two labels. So there's the image and two labels associated with them for the display temperature and the actual display date. Now I mentioned that this isn't using some of the new material design that I may am used to on Android. I can't actually flip between the tabs, which is a little bit weird. And what's going on here? Well, Android applications are built uh, with different themes and styles involved. And with the introduction of uh, Android Lollipop 5.0, material design came about. You can see some of the material design is here. Now, out of the box, you may already have a Xamarin Forms application that does this, or File New. You're getting the base Android templating. So when I come over here into my main activity, we can see that this is just inheriting from a Forms application activity. And this is totally fine. Android applications are activity-based, so it'll create a new activity for each uh, screen of my application. If I go into my properties, we'll take a look at the Android manifest. And we can see right here that our application node, we're using a minimum 15, it can go all the way to the latest, that we're using this theme called Android theme devi device default.light. This means that on uh, Lollipop and above, it will use material design. And on older devices, it'll use like hollow, whatever the device default is. But we want to really give our application a nice stylized theme. And this is where application compact comes in. Essentially, almost nearly all Android applications now are really built with application compatibility to bring material design back to all different Android uh, versions. So I'm going to open up our developer portal at developer.xamarin.com. Here you can find a bunch of resources and tutorials, and specifically Xamarin Forms right here. When you tap on that, it'll bring you to the Xamarin Forms landing page with everything documented that you could possibly imagine. Now, under Platform Features, there's Android and App Compat Material Design. So we want to upgrade this application. This application, with just a few easy steps, we can update it to bring in a few themes and styles into our application. And then we just have to update our actual manifest and bring in some tabs that we want. Now, why would I want to upgrade to AppCompat? And it's a very good question. The reason you want to update to AppCompat is one, it'll give you a nice style for all of applications. So no matter what your application is running on, whether it be KitKat or an older version uh, or Jelly Bean, it'll look exactly the same as your Lollipop or Android N applications. So that's first. Second, with app compatibility with Xamarin Forms, it actually is a huge performance boost for your application, giving it a standardized look, but it changes it to a fragment-first approach. Activities are a heavier way of launching new pages of applications. A fragment approach is very quick to swap in and out pages and inflate views. So that's really why we want to upgrade. So let's take a look at how to do this, and let's jump back into the code. So I've kind of gone through this tutorial. The first thing that we'll do is come into our resources. And here we've added two Android XML files, tabs, and toolbar. I just simply copied and pasted these from our documentation. So I have a tab layout, which will tell exactly how we want to have our tabs laid out. Do I want them to fill? Do I want them to be fixed? Or do I want them to be a slider? What color do I want the actual tab indicator? You can stylize this. And the same thing for toolbar. So what do I want this actual toolbar up top to look like? That was the first thing. Then I came in to my values folder and I added a theme for my application. This gives your application a high level overview. Do you want light theme, dark theme? Do you want it to have different color action bars associated with it? And since we're using our own action bar, this toolbar, we're going to say it's going to be an app compat light theme, no action bar. And use these specific colors for our background, our accent color, and our primary dark, which are associated in this colors folder. So with this one easy step, it'll theme my entire application. So I've added those in, just copied and pasted them from the website. So now I just need to update two parts of my application. Inside my main activity here, we're going to say that this is a forms app compat activity, step one. Step two, we're going to set two resources. We're going to let Xamarin Forms know that the toolbar resource is associated with the toolbar and the tabs with the tabs. Finally, we'll head back to our Android uh, manifest. And we're going to change this theme instead of using a default Android theme to use my theme. Now that my theme came from that style right here, my theme. This inherits from my theme base, which is right here. 
So now with that one simple change of my application, I can now set the Android application as the startup, and I'll go ahead and start it up again. Like I said, this is really important because it's going to give this a beautiful, nice app compatibility theme, but again, also changes it to this fragment first approach, which is going to enable some other things in this application, such as flingable tabs and material tabs to actually really fall in line with the entire material theming. So here we go, it'll go ahead and deploy. There we go. Now the nice thing about app compatibility is that it's baked in to the actual Xamarin Forms Nougat. So there's no additional real things that you need to install. It's right there. And here we go. What we can see is that we have nice material theming. If I ran this application on older devices, it would look exactly the same. I can now fling to and from my actual tabs that are inside of here. We can see that the actual toggles, the switches, are using the accent color from my theme. So if I toggle these on and all, off, same thing here. It's highlighting. So now all of my controls are themed and I have that control. There we go. So that's the first thing. Really nice and it gives it a huge perf boost when you're building a very large application. Awesome. All right. So that's just a high level really first pulling in and building a nice Android application. But what can impact all of our applications today? The first thing I want to talk about is XAML and XAML compilation. Traditionally with Xamarin Forms, you would write your XAML, and then when you would run your application, it would parse and inflate all of your XAML. And this is totally fine. XAML is really small. It inflates pretty quick, uh, but it has some downsides. If you mistype something or type something wrong, then you're not actually going to get errors at all. So we've switched and added a new feature for Xamarin Forms XAML called XAML C, or compiled XAML. And it reverses that. It says, let's compile the XAML when you compile it. We'll parse it and turn it into IL, so that will just run at runtime. This gives you all the runtime checks that you would expect. And also, it gives you some nice perf boosts at the same time. Turning on the single feature can dramatically impact the overall performance of your application. So let's take a look at how to do that in this application. So I'm going to go into my portable class library one more time. And under my properties, I have an assembly information. And what we can see is that I can toggle on and off the XAML compilation with a single line of code right here. So let's say you didn't have this. How would you get it? So I could come in and say using Xamarin Forms. There we go. Then I'll add an assembly flag. There we go. And I'll say, I'll say XAML, ah, Xamarin Forms dot XAML. And I'll say XAML compilation. And the options here are compile or skip. So I want to compile the XAML ahead of time. So if I do this, and let's say I come into my weather view and I mistype something, let's just say stack layout. We can see that it's going to get upset at that, but let's actually go ahead and maybe say mistype padding there, for instance. So it knows the element, but it doesn't know that I've mistyped padding there. So when I go ahead and build this, what we'll see down in our error log is that I actually get a no property, bindable property, or event found at padding, which is really nice. If I had this to skip, which is the default that we have, and I go ahead and compile it, it's not actually going to compile and it says, look, build successful. If I run this, it'll crash my application. So it's giving me that actual nice runtime check. Now, maybe you don't want to turn on for your entire application, which I highly recommend. I, I did it completely with the Xamarin Evolve application. It was totally great. Uh, I did some A-B testing on it and that one switch right here for compile dramatically changed everything in my application, which is great. And it makes sense because we're compiling it down to IL, it doesn't have to parse it. It actually reduces your app size at the same time because now we don't have to include the XAML files in there. So you get faster performance and a little bit smaller application size. But maybe you want to say, I just want to toggle it on page by page, or maybe you do run into some edge case. Let me show you how to turn it on for just a single view. So we'll come back in to, let's say, my weather view and my code behind. And what you can do is on top of your class that's inside of here, I can go in and say, I would like to use, do a using to Xamarin 
forms.xaml. And on top of this, I can say XAML compilation and turn it on with skip or compile. So if you're running into specific problems with a page and you want to compare and contrast, you can turn it on and off or on a page at a time. And this will overwrite anything that was an assembly level, high level overview. So if you want to turn it on for one, just set it to compile and it'll turn it on for that class. Super awesome, super quick to do with just one line of code. That's it. But I've turned it on to my assembly, so we're good. Now, we have lists of data and lists in applications are the essential part of your application. When you think of this application, it's one huge list in here that needs to be super fast and highly optimized for each platform. Now traditionally, these cells can become very complex. If you're doing a lot of data binding uh, and you're doing a lot of images and you're hiding and showing stuff to and from, this application, it's pretty simple, just a few data bindings in it. In fact, let's take a look here at that forecast view. It's just an image and a stack layout automatically for me. Now, ideally though, I really want this, uh, this cell to not have to recreate a brand new cell every single time. What I would really like to have happen is for it to actually recycle the same cell, but just update the binding. And what we added in the Xamarin Forms list view is another performance enhancement, which is called caching strategy. So when I come in and say caching strategy, I can say uh, what would I like? I can say either retain element or recycle element. Retain element is the default behavior and it'll create a new cell for each cell inside of Xamarin Forms, inside this list view. But we don't want that. We would like for it to recycle every element over and over again. So I can just say recycle element. There we go. We set the caching strategy. We set it to recycle element. Now every single time a new cell is created, it'll cache it around. It'll keep it in the cache and just update the bindings. You almost always want to use recycle element. Because this, again, will dramatically increase the performance of the list as you're scrolling it. So if your users scroll things very fast inside the application and try to do this, it'll be super performant. I should actually go ahead and update that, uh, put it back to padding. So that's why we have compiled XAML on. There we go. But turning on recycle element, huge poof, uh, huge uh, perf boost uh, for your application. And we can see it and it affects every single application, whether it's Windows 10, Android, or iOS. So no matter where I'm running this on, it'll recycle the element over and over again. Now the only time that you wouldn't want to use the recycle element is if you have very dynamic, huge, crazy cells that have like 20, 30 data bindings inside of them because it's almost worth it to create a brand new cell every single time. So here we can see everything is cached and it's just as performant, if not now more performant than it was before. So if my users come in and really try to go in and see how fast that is, there's no lag at all, whether on a real device or a simulator or anything out there. And that works across the board, iOS, Android, and of course, Windows 10. All right, let's take a step a little bit further and actually let's just start refactoring and taking a look at some of the other kind of maybe issues inside this application. So the first thing I want to do is talk about how we're laying out our applications. Now the first thing that we'll see here is that uh, I have a stack layout and a list view. I'll drop these down a little bit. We have a stack layout and a list view and that's it. Now there could be a few reasons that I did this and maybe I wanted to add, come in and add a, a little bit extra padding or some margin inside of it. But right now it's not doing anything. So when I think about optimizing my application for performance, there's things that Xamarin Forms can do out of the box, such as what we just saw with compiled XAML and the actual recycle element of the caching strategy, but also things that I can do inside of my actual layout. So the first thing I can do is remove anything that's not needed. The stack layout is creating a whole nother view just to house the view. And just like that, it's one less element that's visible. But let's look at the cell. The cell is actually quite interesting. Uh, if I take a look at it, we can see that it's a stack layout, it's an image, it's displaying an icon and a few labels. Now this is actually creating a few different um, elements inside of it. There's a stack layout, another stack layout, 
I can think about changing this to maybe a relative layout so I can get rid of this additional stack layout here. But I could also use, an, a, use a built-in cell. With Xamarin Forms, there are a few built-in cells that I can use. There's a text cell, an image cell, switch cells. I'm going to use an image cell here. And the image cell is almost exactly what you would think. It is an image with two lines of text. So we can replace this. We can come in and say, you know what? I would like my image source to be a binding to the display icon. I would really like the text of the application to be a binding to the display temp. There we go. Then what I would like is the text color to be this text color. That way it matches what we just had. And then I can say detail. And I can say, oh, I'd like that to be a binding to the display date. Each of these built-in cells are also highly optimized. So if I have a simple cell that is just displaying text, don't use a custom cell that now has four or five different elements in it. Use one of the baked-in cells to give it an additional perf boost. And I'm going to go ahead and run this again so you can take a look and see what this looks like. We expect it to look very similar to what we have here with temperature, display, and the display date, and the time. So this is going to go ahead and, and boot it up again. There we go. I can say get weather and get forecast, and there we go. Now these icons are a little bit bigger, and maybe I want to you know, actually create that actual cell, but this is looking pretty good. And again, it's super highly customized and virtualized for me automatically. Awesome. Let's take it a step further. This one's looking pretty good, but what about this forecast view? Or this weather view? This weather view is looking not so great. We have a stack layout, an entry, another stack layout just to put the label and switch side by side, another stack layout to go side by side, and then another stack layout that's just specifying a padding. You can tell that I'm using a bunch of layouts as padding or wrappers. Essentially what I've done here is I've selected the wrong base layout for my application. And this is okay, and, and this is a good way to start. I just want to slap down a few controls. Now ideally what I would do here is I would use something like a grid. And a grid here will give me the ability to specify rows and columns. So here for instance I have one row, two rows, three rows, and really four rows. So let's go ahead and say, well here's my grid. I would still like a padding of 10, and I can say row spacing of 10 and column spacing of 10. I can control just like I did my stack layout below. Now I can come in and start defining some row definitions. And I'll say row definition. I'll say height. We'll do some auto. There we go. And we're going to have four rows. We'll say star so that'll fill the rest of it. Then what we're going to do is a grid dot column definition. And we'll have two columns. So we'll have a width here that's going to fill it. And we'll do another column definition width. And we'll say auto. Perfect. Now at this point, we can start getting rid of some of these elements. So here I'll just go ahead and say, listen, this entry is going to be the base of it. So that's going to be at uh, at 0, 0. That'll be the default. Now we can start to remove some of these stacks in here. So we have a label and a switch. And we can say, you know what? This label, we want it to be grid dot row of 1. And we'll reuse this a lot. And we can also then say grid dot column equals 1. There we go. Ah, it's also important that we, we make sure that this entry fills two columns, so column span. So make sure it still fills. There we go. Now these here, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and paste that there. And we're going to say this is in column 0 and this is in column 1. We can go ahead and take these again here. And we have another label. And this is the only difference here is that these are going to be in row 2. 
in column one. There we go. And finally, what we could do is we have a bunch of things just stacked on top of each other. So I'm just going to grab these. And we're going to delete all this code, all these other stack layouts that I don't need. Now I can make additional rows if I wanted to, and probably that's another optimization. What I could do here is I could say, let's just put all of these into a stack layout with a grid dot row of three and a grid dot column span of two. There we go. And what we'll do is we'll do this. There we go. That's looking pretty good, but what we can see is that this activity indicator has this additional padding of 20. So I could do another row, I could add some other things, but I need to actually make this a little bit further away than everything else. So we can do that on any control by replacing this padding, that that's all this stack layout's doing, with a margin of 20. So padding is how much space is inside of that stack layout, where a margin is how far away is this control from everything else. So let's now go ahead and remove that stack layout. Now it may look like a very similar amount of XAML that's inside of here, but I've removed all of the additional layouts that are cluttering my application. I can now go ahead and start this application again, and we should expect to see a very similar layout that we have inside of this application. And of course, it's using all those other additions, such as the compiled XAML, the other list view that was increased, right here inside of our application. So here we go. It'll go ahead and deploy. And there we go. Look at that. It looks exactly the same. If I say get weather, it'll go ahead and display all the weather. I can come here. We're getting the same exact view, all super virtualized. But I'm removing all of those additional views that are actually slowing down my application. The more views that Xamarin Forms has to inflate and it has to show, it'll actually slow down the time to actually show that, that page. If I run this application, of course, over on iOS, make that my startup, and run it again, we're going to say this, see the same exact view that we would expect right here, except for it's going to look like it would for iOS. And this is, of course, would be the same on Windows 10. And what's really nice is that it's these small optimizations to the code base that will really add that additional performance that my users will like. So there we go. What do you expect? Get weather. It's a little bit higher off. And boom. We get everything that we expect coming from our application. All right, let's talk about one more thing. Now, we're using those built-in cells here, like we have here for uh, iOS with all the recycle images. But what happens if you wanted to actually do something dramatically different? Let's say if it's rainy outside, I would like to move the actual icon to the right-hand side. Maybe I want to make the cell a little bit of a different color. Maybe that's what I want to do. So there's a few things that I could do here. Uh, I could come in and say, you know what? I really want to come into this forecast view. And you know, this image cell is pretty good, but I want to do this. And I want to put this old cell back. And I could probably move this to a grid. That'd be better. But if I look at my model, we can actually take a look at everything coming in from our data source. And what we'll see is that we have an is rainy. So if there's a rainy icon, we can use that. So I could come in. I could say, you know what? Uh, if uh, where's my, my forecast view? I could do something like, you know, if it's, you know, you know I'll say visible, uh, you know, is, is bound to like a binding of, uh, of is rainy, and, and I, could, I, could, I could essentially try to hide and maybe use some value converters to say show this, but then maybe, you know, if not rainy, then show it underneath, and I could kind of stack these up and kind of clutter this user interface. But if my cells are dramatically different, what I really need to do is add a data template selector. So what I've done here is I've actually created two different cells. I have a normal data cell, so let's take a look over here. I have a normal data template and a rain data template right inside of here and a data template selector. Now I've actually increased the uh, performance here. So I put these into a grid with a column and a row. We can see I just have the same image and the same labels that I had before. Now for my rain data template, I'm actually setting the background color to blue, but I'm switching where the icon is displayed. So I say, if it's rainy, put that on the right-hand side and make the background blue. And everything else is kind of the same. Now here's what I can do inside my application. I have a data template selector, which is just about 
20 lines of code. And it says, hey, save out a data template, so cache these around, and when I'm scrolling through my list, call this method. Cast it to a weather route, and if it's rainy, return the rain data template, else return the normal data template. Pretty simple. So here's what I can do, is I can actually now come back into my weather view, right here, and we can actually use this template. So here's what I've done is I've added this namespace to say, hey, my cells live in my weather dot cell namespace and it's in this assembly. I've added in this content resource to say, hey, templates, use my weather data template selector. Now instead of increasing and adding this data, this item template here, I can come in and I can say item template equals a static resource of this key. There we go. So instead of morphing and changing my cell, I just do it right here inside of the actual data template. This will go through and as I'm going through my application, we could add a breakpoint here to say, is it rainy, is it not rainy? And based on that type of application and type of that weather, it'll return the correct cell. Now, it doesn't have to be the same data object. You may have a list of objects that are coming through so it could be a cat, it could be a dog, it could be a sender, it could be a receiver. It's kind of up to you and you can kind of determine it. So here for instance, we can see is it rainy, is it not rainy? And then we're getting our breakpoints here. So now when I come over to my forecast view, as I scroll down, there's some rain, it has a blue background, and my cell is on the right hand side for my image. Pretty cool. Just with a few lines of code, I've optimized the cells and I've optimized it here. All right, one final performance tip and trick. I'm going to show you my weather view model. This is my main source of my, my data binding, my location, if I use GPS, my temperature, my condition, and my forecast items. What we're seeing here is that we have an observable collection of forecast items. Whenever I call get weather, it goes out, it clears my items, and then it uses this weather service using open weather map to go get the forecast. It loops through all of them and adds them. Observable collection will automatically raise an event to Xamarin Forms and tell it to add a new item to the cell or to the actual list view. Now, it's not too bad if you have, you know, five, ten items, but what's actually happening here is that the forecast items observable collection will fire a notification every single time an atom is item, atom is item or removed. Unfortunately, there is no add range inside of here. If I go in and I say add range, there is not one. It's just how observable collections work. So, my kind of, my kind of final performance uh, tip is that I've created a library. So, on my GitHub page, if I go to my repositories here, I can look for MVVM helpers. It's a simple NuGet package that adds a cool few things. Any, for any application, such as an observable object, a grouping, some utilities, but most importantly, an observable range collection. It takes an observable collection and it turns it into uh, a range collection. So you can add range, remove range, replace range. It's pretty awesome. So all I've done here in this application is gone in and I said manage NuGet packages on everything. And I've added in my MVVM helpers. So now what I can do is I can come up and I can simply say observable range collection bring in the MVVM helpers namespace, swap these all out to here, there we go. And now instead of saying add range, I can say forecast items dot replace range. This will do f dot items, and with that single call, it will only trigger a single update notification to Xamarin Forms and update all my items inside of my list. That's it. Simply a change from observable collection to observable range collection, huge, huge perf boost. Now I said there's some additional resources that you should definitely check out. When you tap on Xamarin Forms here on our developer portal, you'll be taken down here to every single section you can imagine. And under development, testing, and metrics, there's a performance tab in our documentation. Great video with Jason Smith 
It's one of the leads of Xamarin Forms. You can watch that from our Xamarin Evolve, but tons of other great optimizations of knowing what to choose, what to pick. So there you have it. Some awesome quick wins that you can put into your application. I'm going to put this source code, the Xamarin Evolve source code, all that great links into the show notes. Hope this has been helpful. I'm James Montemagno, and this has been The Xamarin Show.